Whenever Might take we're... more minutes, but <laughs> it's good for now. All right. So we will call to order the select board meeting for Monday, January 11, 2016. It is now 6.04, just a few minutes behind. There's one change to the agenda. Okay. Um, Bob is... Donis, they will not be here tonight. We got an opinion from our engineer and they're saying off the landfill for three years. Three okay, years. So. By everything that seeds and, the, and all that. So, yeah. so I spoke strap. to Bob, so he's off for that. He's looking for other land, but since he won't be here tonight, it'll be Darla and her group. Okay. <laughs> Darla, so, I am my group. Darla and her group of one. <laughs> so we will move on then. We will take off Bob Donis from the Energy Committee um, at the 620 appointment. And we'll go to number two. And uh, visitors' appointments. And Darla is here. You want to come on up? Sure. To talk to you about the acoustic group for Holly Hall. And that's the email that Darla um, sent you and that I printed it out for you. It says Tree Ridge. Yeah. Um, because I. We had people had asked about um, about the numbers and what it was and etc. So um, I'm asking to know if you guys had seen the lovely new programs. So I brought you copies of that too. Oh, nice. I couldn't remember if I handed them out last night's year. Or, you know, if you have one, two is good, right? No, I don't <laughs> I'll think I didn't see one. Oh, okay. So Tree Ridge came in back in 2009, and some of you who've been around for a while, Joel and Peeker may remember, um, they did a full acoustic analysis of the upstairs. They, um, uh, Tree Ridge is um, Martin Hawks, who actually lives here in Bristol, and he works with Bose um, sound systems, and he also did this uh, it's very similar design to what he's proposing here at Town Hall Theater in Middlebury. So when they do the sound assessment, they um, basically, it's kind of cool, they, they stick your head in a box and say, this is what it sounds like <laughs> if you have an orchestra, if you have a speaker, you can oh, hear wow. what it would sound like, it uh, tuned properly, and it's incredibly different from what we have upstairs at the moment. Uh, so you have all experienced <laughs> Holly Hall and what it looks like. Um, if you're ever interested in reading <coughs> the full report, I have it upstairs. Um, the report doesn't change um, just because it's a different year. It sounds the same as it did in 2009 because we <coughs> haven't made any changes. But there's all kinds of uh, information in here and, and uh, what happens, where the sound goes and how it goes and why it goes to where it goes. So all of that's there. So what you're seeing um, in this estimate from Tree Ridge is what they're telling us. Um, not only did we talk to them about sound, but we talked to them about controlling light in that room as well. And I'm not talking about so much theater light as I am the light from the windows. Um, if we were to have presentations there right now, it's really hard if, if you're showing film to control that light during the day. It's just really hard. If you were trying to show spreadsheets on a wall to talk to somebody about uh, you know something, it's it's near impossible. So this also you'll see includes motorized blackout shades, which I which I've heard good things about from one place and not so great things about another place. Um, so you know. That's, that's that. Um, to be investigated further. <laughs> uh, we've talked to people about putting <coughs> regular curtains up. Um, that has a certain amount of maintenance, a certain amount of shelf life. Um, we've, talked, we've talked to a lot of people over the years about a lot of things. This is the third reincarnation of this grant that I'm aware of um, that we're talking to. And we're talking with the Vermont um, Department of Cultural Facilities to look for some matching funds for this program. Mm -hmm. So this is where the numbers come from. One of the things in my recent investigation, um, in the most recent investigation, is that with uh, part of the American with Disabilities Act, if we make any changes, I found out that we also must um, include um, what's called um, listening, uh, listening devices. Mm -hmm. So for anyone who has a hearing impairment. So it's kind of like the playground. We couldn't just make changes to the playground. We had to make it ADA compliant. We'd have to make this space ADA compliant. And, and that's I, what this $3,000 is? No, that's above and beyond that actually. Um, that actually, this is new. I mean, I just found this out in the last couple of weeks. Oh, okay. So nice. this is new information for us. So um, I was talking with the folks at um, Culture Facilities and they gave me some information and showed me where, the, where in the law it states that if you're making changes to a public space, that you would have to have assisted listening devices. Okay. They range in price from anywhere from $3,000 to $25,000, depending on what you want to do. So wow. we have some options as far as that's concerned. And I reached out to Martin to ask him his advice, what works with the system that he's mm -hmm. recommended. Um, and I also reached out to a couple other guys that work with sound to see what they've 
on what they like. I talked with Doug Anderson. They have um, headsets that they're using right now. They would like to change over to what's called a halo device where you actually wear it around your neck. Have you seen those? No, I haven't, but I know that they're more popular. They're much more popular. They have a better quality of sound. And if um, most hearing aids now are, um, are electronic, mm -hmm. and they will actually, this Halo device will speak to the assisted listening device. Oh. And yes. so if you have a cochlear implant or a newer hearing aid, um, it, it, you actually hear it through mm -hmm. your hearing aid, not well, that's just amazing. amplified sound. Yeah. Where if you put the headphones over a hearing aid, sometimes it, it can be difficult, is my different. understanding. <laughs> so there's a little bit of research for us to do on that as well. So um, while we've got a lot of footwork done, um, the grant that we're looking for not only can, it does require matching funds. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're looking at close to a little over $30,000 as it stands right now without improving anything um, with the assisted listening device. So we have to decide on what we would want there. Um, we've been doing some fundraisers. We have two coming up uh, later this month. We have um, The Old Bones is doing a concert for us upstairs. Um, and that's on the 30th of the month, I believe, that last Friday. Whatever of January? Of January. The 29th. The 29th. And um, then we have on the 22nd, I'm, I'm sorry, the 23rd, actually, there's um, a dramatic reading of the gin game. So Gateway players are doing, um, are holding that performance for us and, and uh, donating all the funds to the, um, to the acoustic fund. And so, you've currently done a letter, right? And, and, and we've done we a letter. Checks, they went to the Five Town Friends of the Five Town Friends of the Arts was the uh -huh. um, fiscal sponsor. Yeah. So, do you know how, if you've made any? For a couple thousand dollars that's come in nice. so far. I'd say probably around two and a half, three. Nice. So okay. it's, and they're still trickling in a little bit. A little bit. You know? Nice. Yeah. So people are responding to that. So we did do a letter writing <laughs> campaign. Um, yeah, we have a few other fundraisers in the works. They tend to, you know, anywhere from. 500 to 1,000 bucks at a time, you know, it's every little bit helps, yeah. <laughs> you know. Now you had said to me, and we didn't go into the details, but that when you spoke to Doug Anderson at, at um, Town Hall Theater that he was mentioning maybe some grants and some other things, avenues that you guys haven't had a chance to look into yet that might be money. He mentioned a couple of different things, things that uh, that we could look, that we can and, and, and will be looking into. Um, a couple of them were uh, were bigger um, federal grants, which you know, once you get into federal money, mm -hmm. that is a it's a tough. good and a bad thing, depending yeah. on what you want to use for vendors. Um, one of the things that we want to make sure is that when we're prepared to go forward, that we can when you when you get a grant, you usually need to use it within a year. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that when we go to apply for these grants, that we're ready to move forward within that next calendar year. Otherwise, you lose those funds and you're starting all over again. Yeah, that's a good point. So, so we were looking to see what may be available from you fine folks. Um, so I, I gave you guys tonight the updated um, uh, capital building fund, and I added in you know Howden Hall. The estimate was fifteen thousand. We're just we're just not sure yet. I don't know how much. We don't know how much rot. Uh, repairing the library roof, the emergency exit. Um, so a, as I had told you, and I had told Darla earlier, and Darla did tell her folks, is that you know we just right now we don't have the money this year, and so maybe an additional year of fundraising. And I wondered about capital campaign, you know, your thoughts for your committee as far as, could we put something in front of Holly Hall, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I don't know, Joel, you've seen like those before, like in front of like the a thermometer, in front of, yeah, like a thermometer yeah. type thing, yeah. and you know, I, I don't know, um, and I knew at one point you hadn't had a chance to get your group back together to talk about things because people were out of town. And right, Carol's away again, Rick's in Cuba right now, actually. Wow. <laughs> so, so that's why I gave so you this, this, Darla, I thought yes. this might be, and then you could kind of see yeah. where the money, some things are pending, so the money is reserved for something, that's why it says pending beside it. Yeah. I thought that might be helpful to you, Darla, when um, people are asking, well, why? You can say, well, here's why. <laughs> right, we so need. this year the, um, the cultural facilities grant we would have to apply in May, mm -hmm. um, but again, it's, it will be another year from May before we can do anything if we um, if we don't have matching funds. Um, we have reached out to a couple of other um, grant op grant possible opportunities. Some we some we it's interesting because some of them you if you're not a municipality you could qualify for if you're a nonprofit. Well, we are a municipality and not the nonprofit. <laughs> So it's, you know, it's six of one half dozen of another. So researching the grant is almost as much work as writing the grant itself. Even though Bristol Friends of the Arts is not. Even though, oh, even though it's just, um, it's a, it's a, it's a sticky wicket. Yeah. Does, do you know if, um, I know, um, 
stone works for bows. Is that anything that they ever? Because you know, not generally. Yeah, not, yeah. I mean, he has donated all of his engineering. Oh wow! Uh, which is that's a lot. You can see um, it, it's in the estimate there. Um, he is, it's several thousand dollars worth that's of nice. worth of work, and he donated all of that. Wow! Um, and he's uh, Martin has. Um, his resume is, is pretty impressive. I mean, he's yeah. done some really big concert halls. Um, the Royal Tyler in Burlington is one of, he's a UVM uh, alumni, and he's, nice. he's uh, done sounds there. He's put in sound studios. I mean, his, um, you know, he comes with a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, and living here in town, he's, you know, has an affinity for this particular hall. That's now, nice. is, um, I mean, I know Bose is, you know, superior sound systems and everything, but I mean, do they sell anything besides bows? I mean, if we come come up short on money, I mean, you know, I, I mean, we don't have this year, obviously, but I mean, if next year this comes around, but we're still short, I mean, is there, do they sell another product besides bows? Or? They do not. Our Martin, this particular tree ridge works exclusively with bows. Could we substitute something? Sure. Um, but when you're writing a grant, it's always best to ask for the biggest number. Yeah, well, no, no, definitely. But, I, but yeah, I just think, I mean, you know, you've got 20, <laughs> two thousand dollars in you know into equipment you know right. and i mean bose is great i mean if you can afford it it's the best well and within bose there are different levels of there's quality a level of quality well. yeah yeah so I mean, this is what he's recommending we could choose to go with something lesser but again this was more for for grant the purposes grant. Okay. is what he gave this for and there are other companies we could look at but he does not work with them himself um, so that's a big especially if he's doing i don't i don't see where it's like how i here that he is but that's you know, certainly. So it's a good point for you to bring up. I guess is what I'm thinking. Yes. I think. Oh yeah, I think it's the three. Is it the three thousand dollars the allowance? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's given us that already. Yes, the uh, the sage, the shades for the balcony and the main sides. Are they the type that also they'll absorb the sound? Yeah. They're the quilted or. Well, they're not quilted, but it's a material that will that that doesn't reflect the sound the way that a hard surface does. It's the same thing that they have at the theater in Middlebury. Okay, and like I said, they've had um, mixed results with theirs uh, with their um, motorized shades. Doug was telling us, but I talked to another um, organization out of Barry that uses the same shades, and they love them. I've never had any trouble with them. So could be the installation, could be the could be the person's picking the switch. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, and there, like I said, there are different things that we could do. We could possibly do, you know, pieces and parts of it. You know, it's hard to, um, when you're writing a grant, it's nice to be able to write one big grant and get it done, yeah, get it paid for. Yeah. On the other hand, we could do, you know, perhaps we could do part of it. Um, but what happens with cultural facilities, you have to wait two years before you can apply again. So it puts us in a position, if we only go for part of it, then we are waiting two years before we can even get to the next. And part. that's a fifty-fifty grant. And that's a fifty-fifty grant. So, um, which we have a very they they like our hall. They've worked with us before. Um, and where are we, what number do we stand at right now for what we have for fundraising? I believe we had about four thousand in the account before we got started. We've got, I think we've put in I want to say another six with what what just came in in. Um, yeah, because this slide board you already gave them the Pepperell Peak money, which yeah. was what forty three hundred. So that's including the forty three hundred from yes. the Pepperell Peak. Yeah, that's the four thousand. The first four thousand. Yes. Said? No, no, no. I'm sorry. That's in addition to. There was some fundraising done a couple of years ago that went toward the acoustic. Um, so you have, you have the four thousand that you started with. You said yeah. About six thousand that's come in. Yeah. So around ten thousand plus the four thousand. No, about ten thousand. About ten thousand total. total. Yeah. Okay. The six includes Pepperell. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And we continue to do fundraisers. They just. You know, with what we have available, they just tend to be, a, you know, a bake sale at a time. Mm -hmm. Although you did have, and that would be a good opportunity to talk to the select board about the uh, liquor control. We did. I've been, um, I've been talking, as you guys know, with the liquor control about, or not liquor control, but with the fire marshal about um, use of the upstairs space for events. And um, when uh, Jesse was here, he talked to me about the, the need for the hall to be, he believed that the hall would need to be sprinkler in order to have any alcohol at an event, like a wedding reception or, or any kind of event like that. So I've been waiting for his report um, for a while now. I've con reached out to him a couple of times to get his final report. I haven't received it, so I actually called liquor control because that's where he told me the next step would be, would be to speak to them. And they told me that in the type of hall that we have and the events that we would be holding, because they would be 
on an occasional basis, we're not a bar, we're not a, a regular banquet hall kind of thing, we would not need to be sprinklered. That we could do them with uh, as a catered event. We could not receive a liquor license, like the rec department would not hold a liquor license, but we could have, um, we could hire someone to come in with that liquor license. And then we could put whatever parameters we wanted as an entity around that as well. You know, do they need security? Do they, do we limit how many drinks each person can have? What, well, how would we want that to happen? Um, we limit the time frame. We can, yeah. we could figure out all of that. So that um, certainly changes what we could do as far as how we market the hall and what kind of events we could hold in the hall. Mm -hmm. um, and it also talks a lot about revenue. There's a big chance for me to increase revenues right there. Um, could very easily possibly replace the revenues that we're losing to some of the programming issues that we've talked to about in the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great opportunity. Um, and I'd love to uh, get a policy in place and start, um, start utilizing the hall in that way. Yeah. The other thing too is if you know if, if you know if the select board decides to say okay you know what come back in a year let's see how much money you've raised in mm -hmm. a year we'll see what's going on at that point it also would give you the opportunity to possibly hold an event in the hall or have five town mm -hmm. friends of the art sponsor it or something to yep. put towards the acoustic fund or something yes. like that so it yeah we can have a couple of larger and, events and, yeah and maybe even mary's i know you've worked with them before about mm -hmm. holding something out there so yeah we've done that actually holly hall holds more people than their barn does oh really yeah, yeah. their barn isn't as big as you think <laughs> well, no probably not um so that would so that that's good so anyway so darla and i spoke today and she said she was going to look around for some policies and we'll you know, give them to me and we'll look at them together. Try to me first, I think it's great that we've got this up and going again. I think it's the one really important thing you need to do upstairs there. Which is why I pushed to get yeah, that I, I appreciate sitting that. there and I wanted to see it used for something mm -hmm. for the hall. Yeah. That was his intention initially. No, I definitely appreciate that. And I can tell you, um, <coughs> I think you're even more than, than most of you do because I'm in the hall. Yeah. But so many seniors especially talk to us about <coughs> they just don't come to meetings. They just can't. Or when they do come to a meeting, they don't feel like they can really participate because they can't understand what's yeah. being said. To say nothing of the number of musicians that, you know, when Midwinds was here, they're such a big group. If you've ever seen Middlebury Wind Ensemble. Yeah. They, from the music, once it leaves one side and hits the other side, they're playing different music now from each other. So it's, oh, wow. for, a big, for a big orchestra, it makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, for those of us sitting out in the, you know, we may not hear it, but they hear it differently where they I think are. if they can all, if the, if the size of the band allows them to be confined up on the stage, I think they're okay. It's better, mm -hmm. yeah. And acapella groups love it because they like their sound to bounce all over. Mm -hmm. But an orchestra or, you know, <laughs> the woodwinds. a band, you know, or an actual rock and roll band doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't really care for it. <laughs> <laughs> But like I said, public meetings are, are the main concern actually is for, for us. Yeah. Um, and, and again, how we market the hall. You know, if we can market it as a meeting hall or as a corporate space, as, mm -hmm. you know, it's different ways that we can utilize the space that we have already and bring in revenues and bring people into Bristol as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's a good thing. So, always a good thing. Yeah. So, that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any more yeah. questions for Darla? Little direction, or what do you want to see? Find some money. Here, or yeah, you know, money. I'm always yeah. looking for money. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we're. I, I think the board is, is on board with you know oh, yeah. doing what we can. It's just mm -hmm. the funds just aren't there this year to 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 allocate towards that much towards that. I mean, so I mean, it, it, I would say that if you could do what you can in the next year mm -hmm. to fundraise and then come back next year this time and we can do that. It's it's a great group. I want to you know I want to um, you know acknowledge the folks that I'm working with and uh, and they've come with great ideas, things I would not have thought of, um, and and people to talk to. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, I like I said, I, mean, I think we're all supportive of it. It's just you know the budget is a the budget scary this year. So agreed. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. I have a couple of names I can give you later on for shades. Okay. Motorized and non-motorized. That'd be great. At least you can have something to compare. Compare it to. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And we have done um, some comparison along that. Not so much the motorized. He was the only one that talked to us about motorized shades, yeah. but we have talked about putting regular. What's the difference between putting regular curtains up and not, and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing? So, but alrighty. Good. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Oh. All right.
We'll move on to number three, other business. Number one, public forum opportunity for students who are not on the agenda briefly share comments and concerns with the board. Mr. Jimmy, that'd be you tonight. <laughs> good tonight. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year, you, sir. You. All right, we'll move on. Number two, the discussion of uniform excess weight permit policy. Everybody have their copy of it? It was in the last, not the last meeting, the one before. <laughs> right, not Saturday, but yeah. Thank you for telling us it's not in here, though, so at least I went with it. Well, yeah, I thought that I was afraid, but keep trying to Yes, you did, and I was just reading it before I came down. And... If you need another, I'll well, go back to the well, I can't go make it. I'll just copy your style. Cool. Share, I'll share with you if you yeah. can have it. I just slid it in there. I'll share with you, girls, if you want. No, I've got a ticket. No. Okay. Not unless no. you went back to your old package. No, I didn't go back to old package. Right. You don't have it there. Yeah. I have to. You're all here. Yeah. But what I, what I know about this, you put the symbol, so it's going to be all right. All right. So we'll keep talking. <laughs> all right. Keep so going. I guess we have not had a uniform municipal access permit. We have. Permit. We, no, have, have we, 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 we have not enforced it. No. We had it, and years ago, Penny came to the board and, and said that it cost more money to deal with than it was worth. Okay. At five dollars a truck or ten dollars a a, uh, a company fleet company. that um, it wasn't worth their time to deal with it. Right. Obviously, Pete feels different about it, and the new administration says it's not a big deal. So, okay. A lot of other towns, well, most other towns do it. Starchboro doesn't require them. Uh, but everybody else around us does. Yeah, I know Chittenden County, you know, Hinesburg, Shelburne, Charlotte, up that way, they all are on board with them. But All right, well, does anybody have any concerns about this? Uh, a couple. All right, we'll go um, right ahead. The weights. Um, yeah. The tractor trailer weight, I know they can register up to 98,000 mm -hmm. legally. Um, there's nothing on here for triaxles, which your log trucks and your... I wonder if he was saying I didn't... I, I'm wondering if the not. 72 was... was the, my triaxles are registered for 69. Okay. The tri... The, um... Yeah, tractor trailer seats at 72. And I, I, I wouldn't have known to ask about a triaxle. So, um... Well, like so all your log trucks are triaxle? Oh, are they? I thought they were tractor trailers. All right, so I'm going to write them Well, I shouldn't say all of them, but the majority of them. So a, a log truck, okay. <clears throat> okay, I can ask him about that one. What well, do you think that should be a triaxle? Uh, I know with gravel we can register to 69. I think forest and I think forest and milk products are are 72. I almost think that that's where that 72 comes from. Okay, that could so a triaxle. But there again, now these could be weights that he wants. I well, mean, they are could, a little he bit. Could, he could want to restrict the weight a little bit more. We did, in the sense that we, you know, when Peter, um, we looked back at all of the um, ordinance, or uh, excuse me, language in the state statutes about that. And that was a piece of it, yes. There was some that he did restrict. And so he was saying he thought 72,000 for the tractor trailer, 60 for a tandem. These are numbers that he came up with. We had yeah. a little bit of different numbers in the beginning that we had tweaked. And these are the numbers he is suggesting. I, I just know that the companies moving equipment through town and, and your milk haulers and... Well, if you look, um, um, hmm, hmm. well, farm vehicles, probably yeah. a milk truck wouldn't be considered a farm vehicle, though, would it? Not if it's registered. Yeah. They don't have to register if they only run in state, but if they run, okay. and, and a lot of them run. Mm -hmm. But a good share of those milk tankers are more than 72,000 pounds. The, 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 they're running full. The, the, the tractor trailers. Tractor trailers. Tractor trailers. If, once they're full, they're more than. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're around 100, 105. Yeah. Okay. So triaxles, 72,000, and you're wondering if milk trucks, log trucks should be higher? Well, not higher than the, than the, definitely not higher than the 72. Okay, so I, I don't know where the 72 came from. I don't know where. From it, either. And I'm not sure what, um, I know all I can register for with gravel is 69. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a, I think there's a loophole there for ag and forest products. Yeah. And those guys, you, you know, you've got 
Lathrop's and Johnson's that are both in town and they run log trucks. She's right. And well, I, I think guess, that's kind of what he was looking at saying, all right, let's just give a little bit of wiggle room here as far as, um, you know, what we're giving out for weights. Ooh, I think what he was really thinking about who's on the road on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, so basic, are you just looking for some changes in the language? So the 72,000 is includes triaxles. Yeah, I think you're light for tractor trailers, but if, it, if that's, I, I said they're getting, it depends on what he's trying to accomplish. Yeah. I mean, I know that when Carrera, when Carrera applies for their mixers, they're going to ask for all they can ask for. I think the max is 98. But their mixers are, are well, they're four axles. Mm -hmm. Quad axles, so. But I think the max. Well, I guess, I guess my concern would be is, can we, should we look at what the other towns around us are? I mean, are, we, are we going to go stricter than another town? I, I mean, and then old, that's old, just the well for something we have. I, I just you know for something we haven't been enforcing, and that's the other thing is how how are we intended on enforcing this, or are we okay. just looking for trucks to have permits? We we were looking for trucks to have permits because originally when we first drafted this we said eighty thousand pounds and then Peter. Um, when I sat down with Peter, he said, okay, um, 70, and he was said, okay, no, Teresa, I'd rather see 72,000, and we went, we, he went through the numbers. What we did was we looked at this um, general information about weight limits. 80,000 is for state roads, um, 24,000 for class two, three, or four um, town highways, and we were looking at this as long, and also log vehicles often 80,000 to 90,000 and sometimes more you're right and it does say that we can specify um i think that's what we need to uh, i mean we need to know if, if pete's looking to just know who's on his roads or if he's looking to to uh to curb the weight if he wants to be less than what's what they're registered for yeah i think he's looking for both he wants to know who's on there and i know part of it is he wants to curb for example, I'm just going to use this road as an example, is Cove Road. Yeah. And as he a said, shortcut. As a shortcut, because he said it's dangerous. People shouldn't be on there. And he said, to be honest, I mean, if someone's delivering fuel, then get on, get off. But that's what he's looking for. I think he's looking for a little bit of both, to control some of the weight, but also know who's on it. So if he does have a problem later, he can go back and see you know, who's permitted for the road. But I am certainly happy to um, have him look at the weight limits again and maybe just come back, come in and talk to you a little bit about that. Were there any other questions besides weight limits? Just the, just the, um, you know, whether we were looking, how we were going to enforce this. I know our police force isn't, we don't have anybody truck certified, do we? Uh, yeah. No. And, well, we, and we certainly don't have scales. Randy had gone to training. You've got a subject interested in part-time work with us who is truck certified and we don't have scales, but we are working on trying to get access to them. Well, you won't, the scales are owned by DMV. I know, but we're, we're trying to work a way of getting access to scales. Because mm -hmm. I know we had a conversation last summer about mm -hmm. the bridge work. Yes. Um, we, we had a conversation about, you know, future truck weighing, and so we're kind of trying to work that angle. The other angle is too, if can't you if if they stop a vehicle, you can at least see if they have a fleet permit. Is there a fine if no, someone they don't does not keep, they don't keep a permit? No, I know, but trucks. they could we it's provide a, a list to the police department. Yes. Pam this, provides a this list. This here says that if it's a single truck they will have one. If it's a fleet, they don't fleet have to carry one. That's what the state says. That's their policy. Okay. They're the ones. Well, I, know, I, just, I know with us we just call back to dispatch and ask if dispatch has Yes, they still everybody has to or should have a permit. Right. Um so the question is, if you pull someone over and they and it's a single vehicle and they don't have a permit, is can you find them for that or not? Is there no? If they can get if they can get them weighed, they can find them for everything over twenty four thousand. What I've done in the past when I've when I've had an overweight truck, um, based on the paperwork they've given me, I have issued ticket for overweight vehicles with essentially a really underestimated weight that's overweight. We do have the ability, if DMV's in the area, to have them meet us with scales, or we can contact Virgins, and if they're off, they got an officer who has scales, they can meet us. So what do you do? Take do you have a load slip in the truck, and so well, you're figuring it as that? I mean, what? you know, really, all I'm I mean, asking how he calculates. Really, you can only 
right the overweight permit for what the GBW on the truck is. So if they're if, if the GBW on the truck is a sixty thousand pound truck and they're on a twenty four thousand pound road, you can only rate the difference between the twenty four and the sixty thousand pounds That's unless you have scales. Unless you have scales to weigh them. Right. If you don't have the scales to weigh them, it doesn't matter if the back of the truck is full of gravel. You can't. Because I'm not aware that they have any kind of paperwork. I, I don't deal with enough of these. To, to the, the thing is, you no, no one have, goes by with what the paperwork in the back of their their trucks are because it's not always the scales that like the milk tankers, for example. I will tell you, they're notorious for being overweight because the scales that they drive across aren't certified they're not calibrated they're not whatever mm -hmm. and i know what they'll show us a, a weight slip ticket when i'm out on doing trucks mm -hmm. and that will not mm -hmm. it will not be with what the way mm -hmm. in the truck is when we weigh the truck right. so but so you do have the ability without investing in scales for you to look yes, at the weight you can, of the vehicle you can weight and the, the weight difference of, of the weight of the road right. and the vehicle is all right yes but if a, a career don't a career smith truck leaves his printout has what that truck weighed when he left and if he's up we can only write. We can only. We have to wait. If you're going to try to write them for the pounds of what they're hauling, you've got to be. You've got to weigh them. You can't just go off what's on their, okay. off their ticket. You have. We have to use the certified scales, through, BMV. And as and as I know it right now, Shelburne is the only municipal park that has BMV scales. Um, Williston's trying to get them, and they're telling them no. And I, so I mean, they're not. They're not real. Friendly about giving out their scales because they're very expensive. They're theirs. They're calibrated. They, they belong to the DMV. I mean, you know, we've had to promise our life. Somebody did at Shelburne to, to get those scales. I've had I've had tickets issued on my weight slips. I do for the simple fact that that um, you know they're. I didn't talk to them with the officer. I told them they were, they're, the scales are certified by the state. And I'm paying weights and measures. You know, they're they're checked by weights and measures. And I, you know, I I wasn't contesting the fact that I was overweight. Yeah. Um. So. Um, I, I guess I don't know. I'm just going by what I was trained with. You know, I, I'm in the last that year probably, that you know. I'm guessing that. You know, I had no intentions of fighting it, but I suppose if he wrote it on that. Well, that, that I think that's the thing. Fight. You know, you tell me, yeah, I'm overweight, so I write you what you tell me is on your truck, and then yeah. you then you take me to court, and then I've got to stand in front of the judge. Well. I don't know. Yeah. Peeker told me it was that much. I I took him for his word, and you can say, well, that wasn't what was on it. I dumped half of it, and I forgot it. Mm -hmm. Forgot that I dumped half my load already. Well, and you can also look at this. Think of that. This think might of help that. you no. because I don't. This is two, three, four, five, six, seven axles. This is the state, and then so tri axle. I'm assuming there you go. Is so they're saying sixty thousand, and so they or kind of have this. Um, if this is eight or less. And they show you how many axles it has. There's this breakdown. This is in state statute. Mm -hmm. So the max, it looks like they have is 80. And it does say here, no single axle of the tri-axle group I don't know, shall no. support more than 22,400 yeah. no, pounds with no a 10 axle, on. No axle is legal for more than 22,000 pounds. Yeah. So, but I will certainly, why don't, since you don't have any other questions aside from that, why don't I just get Peter to come in and, and, um. And those, those. Weights there mm -hmm. are, are not special weights. No, there's a because whole they're you know you. It's there's a special. It's a special permit to register a tandem for sixty thousand pounds. Yes, yeah, it it's says, a special permit to register a triaxle for sixty nine. Exactly, and it says that here. These pound, these are this permit fee shall be one hundred and fifteen. This one should be two sixty. So you're right. There's definitely if you read all seven pages, then it gets into a whole bunch of other things where you're registering them for 285 directly with the state. I guess I have a, just a question. Okay. We go through all this, and maybe I can see why Penny said it wasn't worth the thing. But if well, we go through all this, it's will it stand up in court? Yes. We are using... Then we have to advertise it with that, which asks your No, this bill. isn't an ordinance. This is your policy. This is a policy. And this yeah. permit right here comes right from the state. It's the but same permit that everybody uses. Yeah. And what will happen is when this, when these permits come back, whatever Carrera wants to run, they'll put on for weight. Whatever A. Johnson wants to run, they'll put on for weight. And then... And they'll still pay $5. And they'll pay yeah, the $10 for fleet. Fee. And then... Peter will go through them and decide whether he's going to accept that weight or he's going to cut it back. Mm -hmm. And then, knowing truckers, they're going to run with that weight anyway mm -hmm. and take their chances. Yeah. And then, I mean, so it does open the, the, 
Bristol police could write between the difference of the road and what the so you, you know, mentioned two are. places mm -hmm. will set their own way. Just they'll no, they'll request the way. There's a oh, there's request. He I'm has sorry. that's what happens right a here. A company's going to request to run the highest weight. They put a max the allow them. right there on the front page. Max weight requested. They put it and then Peter writes what he's actually going to oh, okay. give them. And one of the issues, of course, was that the other thing is it does require them to furnish us with a certificate of insurance, which is nice. So if there is damage done to the road, then you know, you have some recourse. It also or if says, they lose their load yeah, if they, I mean, we've had times where we've had to call someone to come, and, yeah. you know, road crew, can you come clean up the intersection because somebody lost a load? And Peter's like, you know, we don't know. You know, he usually figures out eventually who it is. Yeah, it's not usually very hard to figure it out. <laughs> no. But the good thing is, I mean, that also as a policy, he has a real thing. He doesn't want the roads to be used as shortcuts because it puts a lot of abuse mm -hmm. in it and it's unsafe, you know, so. Yeah, I think there's once it's documented that, that you're not allowed to use them as shortcuts, yeah. then then there's two issues. If, they, if they're if they using them and they don't have a permit, and, and then there's yeah. two. There's a fine there, and if they're using them, even if they have a permit. Right. If they, it, if they can't say, I didn't know, because they know they're supposed to have a permit. Yeah. Yeah. So Anything I'm, over 24,000 pounds is supposed to is supposed to have, if you have this policy, is supposed to have this permit. So I can, um, I am happy to have Peter come on the 25th at six, so let's bump the PC in 15, 20 minutes, and let him, he can articulate this better than I can. I just, I'm the writer. He gives me the stuff, I read it, I write it. Well, I can visit with him ahead of time, too, yeah. and see just exactly well, you what. Have I, I, you more know, I know questions. that he, I know that he wants to curb these trucks from running shortcuts, yep. which, which I think is a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just not exactly sure what he's after with his with his um, weight restrictions. Yeah. No, and I think that's good because you can ask him questions I wouldn't know to ask him. I can read the statue, I can write a draft, I can read other people's and give him that and then he comes let's, back and lets let me Let me ask Peter, like the truck the trailers that came up and hauled all the stuff for the landfill. They were running close to 100,000. So why don't we, should we at least put, if it's a tractor trailer loaded, put it to its a reasonable load weight or no? Or the, we want you to run, they had to take 30,000 off that, 28,000, that's a half a load or? Yeah, it's, it's a fair amount. So, you see what I'm saying? No, I know, I know exactly what you're saying. I'm just telling you how truckers are. I mean, you're, ask, you said your 10 of the 69,000 pounds. That's what, I'm, that's what I can And you can only put 60 in it, so yeah. okay, fill it two thirds. and well, Which like, you know is not going to happen. It's yeah. Gonna happen. And I know it's the same thing. I can remember when we did it before. Carrera's, Carrera's request for weights was always more than what we had on our slips. And their argument was it's what we're registered for, it's what we pay the state of Vermont for, it's what we're running, you know, it's what we're running on 116 coming up here. Mm -hmm. So if they, they're running one of their front loader mixers and it's 100,000 pounds down to a house on Porn Foundation on Cobble Road, and it's. it's uh, uh, it's, They're overweight. Are they in violation because it's not a shortcut? But it's still violate if we pass it because it, they're and, and they're over miles. well over sixty thousand. Mm -hmm. Over. I, I think I, I we need to look at it because I mean I get my other question would be you know we're hoping that you know we're going to be developing a business park here and then if we're telling you know businesses that they can't have tractor trailers come with full loads to to either pick up or deliver their products. Where you know, I think we're kind of and he could fighting ourselves from, at, at that point in time. I mean, this is he could also change the class. He could set it up for classes. Yeah, like class I mean, one. Easily, this isn't, because there's a lot of you know tractor trailers. You can go from from um, three axles all the way up to ten. Yeah, I mean, like you, reading you, the you, gain, you can gain a, a yeah. ton of axles in a hurry. So yeah, I mean, a lot of these a lot of these people that move this stuff are. They're registered and they have that, that 22,000 pounds per axle Absolutely. is what they, that's why they have more access so they can run that Keep extra weight. weight. And, and he can break it up per class of the road too. So there could be another way to do that as a mm -hmm. class one, class two, I mean, because this is for class two, three, your, four. Of most of your uh, logs are going to come off your class, class three four. and four roads. Exactly. <laughs> Which, you know. Right. Yeah. You can come out of upper notch, come off yeah. the Ripton road with a load of, off a of log landing. Mm -hmm. And he's not unreasonable. I mean, if the idea is just so that he knows he's on the roads and he's not going to go after these guys for running reasonable weights, mm -hmm. 
You know, I'm not, yeah. I'm not saying that if they're running over their registered weight, I'm not saying that that, they're not some, yet, that, that they shouldn't be nabbed. But, uh, but if they're running their legal weights, are we going to go after them to, well, well, only if we have a problem? You know, I could see, see if you're running, if it's 30 and you're running 37, you might be okay, but if you're running 42, you probably Yeah, you're running well, 30 and you've got 68 on it. Yeah, well, I will ask yeah. Peter to come. Yeah, so it sounds like and we I can see it have more discussions. In, in the spring. You know, when we well, the roads are posted then, and, and you then should be asking for I don't blame him when you said you catch somebody on the permission, permission then. You didn't ask, you know, you catch certain, oh, I snuck up through there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and you just sunk out of sight. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, that fine is from 19,000 pounds up to whatever you got. When the road's posted. There. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the one I'd like to see, you know, yeah, you call the Rosetta Scales then and say, no, the, he drove right past the posted road, a road sign because it's spring. No, I, I think I, it's not a bad idea to know who's on our roads. Yeah, that's And it's not a bad idea. I just, you know. I, no, it's good, Peter. You have questions. You know, well, those are good I mean, questions. I got, he needs so just to tell us what he's looking for. Because, I mean, this obviously, I mean, it's not a money making game because no. you're yeah. making no money at this no. like $5 and $10 a shop. No. I mean, but it is no, nice no, to have no, 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 money we want to know. Yeah, I mean, we're not trying to make money. Not a $10 <laughs> yeah. All right, so we'll have Peter, or uh, Peter, I'm sorry, we'll have Pete come in at the next, the next meeting. And I'll try to catch up with him ahead of time right. so that he keep. You guys can answer my questions. And, yes, and, and, right. that would be nice. Thank you. All right, discussion regarding traffic study prepared by ACPRC. So, I was going to read your planning. So, I gave you the information. Um, yeah. One of the things we could start with is Joel's request to do the traffic volume count. So, on Plank Road, the annual, the average daily traffic for that period of time was 545 cars. The annual average daily traffic for the previous few days on the lower notch road was 509. So they are similar. Mm -hmm. Remember you asking about that. 500 um, what's for Plank? 545 for Plank Road. This would do everything. Yes, I do. 545 for Plank Road and 509 <coughs> for um, lower notch. They're double sided, yeah. so. Um, the other one was we did, as he did, the speed count because the select board was interested in reducing the speed limit in the village, and this engineering study does not support that. The, the other option you do have to, we could consider is we could, if you wanted to do just, um, when I say Main Street, I'm just talking about... Street light to... Yeah, right, like from the traffic light to, um, tree, to Mountain basically. Street. If you wanted to reduce it just in that area, I'm not really sure if it's, if it's worth it to you to do that. I, I don't know. I, can, I could have them do it. But the speed, we could try it again and, and change the areas. You have a hard time doing 30 down through there anyway. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would not be in favor of trying to just change that one stretch. Okay. That one, I mean, that's my personal opinion. I would not. No, you have a hard time doing 30 down through there. I mean, it's got to okay. be, it's got to be nighttime when yeah. nobody's on the road. Right. Did they give a reason why, Trish, they didn't recommend lowering it 25? Yeah. Well, because we can't, um, we just can't do it legally. You have to, um, when you, what happens is, the way the law is written now is that you have to do your study, which we did, and then you subtract five miles per hour from it to get your 85th percentile. You track who's in the 85th percentile. You take. Okay, so that's what they did here, the 29. Yeah. yeah. So if I take the average person was going 34 miles an hour on that stretch of North Street minus five is 29. The same thing on South Street if in that piece was 39. So the traffic study. Says that everybody's says, speeding already. Says so that basically, you, could, yeah. And what the interesting thing is, you could they actually could say, well, you know, in some cases, you should probably increase your speed in that area, which is just, crazy. To just us. because it's people are going too fast doesn't mean that the speed limit shouldn't be reduced. I mean, I, uh, oh, okay. but that's what they say, and this is what he's saying, Josh, uh, uh, from the transportation right. planner. He uh, is saying that. Yeah. Um, he said, I'm telling you, he said, Therese, I, I, this doesn't make any sense. He said that he is trying to get Adam Luigi to allow him to approach the legislature to say, uh, you know, the municipalities should be able to judge, to do their own speed limits. And that, that, they tried that a few years ago and it actually failed. The legislature said, no, you have to have this. And he said, in my mind, Maybe once said, they legalize marijuana, we'll be able to get it through. That's right. 
So he said, however, it is my belief that the state's approach to governing municipal speed limits and reliance on this seemingly arbitrary number is flawed. I've heard stories from multiple towns since I started in this position whose request to lower speed limits was denied strictly on this 85th percentile number. I've mentioned it to Adam and would like to explore a legislative fix that either does away with or alters the 85th percentile approach or at least allows for additional community factors to be taken into account. So per the statute as it is right now, we cannot lower the speed limit. Where exactly did they do their testing? Um, we did it um, right I, in front of Master Yeah, I can give you a copy. We, um, I met with, um, did they do any on side streets? No, we had to do the main drags. We had to do south, east, because so we were looking to lower south, the speed. We should have been setting right by the dang mm -hmm. cross things every day. That would have got us within the 85% off. Yeah. West, east, south. I can show you a map so, some other time, yeah. you know, another time. You've written down here, East Street was... Yeah. 47 miles an hour and 41 because minus 5. If you read the study, no, so. if you read the study, it's north, north and north south. Which way they were Right? Going. Yeah. Um, so I was just saying. So I'd like to, okay, I didn't read completely. The, the, I'm reading your notes here. The 47 minus 5 is equals 42. Is that coming into the village or leaving? Um, that's on the East city. Street. That's traveling east. It's coming, going out of the village. And, and that one was near the... Um, Lord's Prayer Rock on this Where we know could can be yeah. can be very and we, dangerous. Yep, and we yeah, and we did I guess, but your traffic your speed limit changes right there at the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, Rock. Yes. I mean but we so. came in a little ways. So the thing about these things is crazy because sure we could bring the, the counter up and, and basically you're manipulating your data because we could move we can move all these traffic counters and do this until we get the numbers we want. But when I set these locations with um, Josh um, from Addison County Regional Planning Commission. You know, we put these as you can see on the little map beside it shows him where he put the counter. Looks like it was like right in front of Eddie Te uh, Ed Shepherd's um, West Street. Yep, it was. He yeah. got killed you, you probably yeah. saw the yeah. the West one on Street. South Street was was at the yes. corner. Um, before Lathrop's, you know, mail coming right. up closer to town. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I drove over that one. I just about I stopped, creep over it. And <laughs> you should have seen it when he was out patrolling. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So anyway, so that's where they were. So at this point, um, North Street was not too far past Yeah, right in front of Masterson's right there. So if yeah. you want, I we could either. redo it again, but at this point I'm just not, I don't know. What well, you're, what's your, you, I can do whatever you want. Uh, you know that I don't really give okay. it very many so people. So our average have... our average speed limit on, uh, speed on E Street is forty seven. Are you in one direction? Yeah, in one direction. Place, Leaving the town. E Street is the worst place you could put it. Historically, and we've had complaints from people who live that. in the vicinity of Lord's Prayer Rock. Put it around Lord's Prayer Rock. The, the, the typical yeah. motorist comes into town and they use that hill to slow down. To slow down, so they don't even approach a reasonable speed until up over that mm -hmm. hill. I mean, it's it's nothing to see vehicles upwards. Of even if we moved an that, you still you couldn't reach it on the other streets. So even if we moved that one in further into town, which is we still wouldn't have met it on the other streets. Even if that one, even because I mean, we're saying the average speed. I mean, the street that I would think would be the fastest street out of Mall would be North Street, and, the, and they're saying the average speed is 29 miles an hour on North Street. No, it's 34 miles an hour. Well, minus one minus the five. Yeah. Well, well, I I I kind of disagree with you, Brian. I think it's east and west. It's the traffic. No, he's saying I'm just telling it you what the study be. says. The, the road that I think that, that we would have the fastest cars on would be North Street because it's a, pretty much a straight road and a straight shot, and there's not a whole lot of stopping for people coming in and out of stuff besides houses. Mm -hmm. You don't have any businesses up really. Once you you don't have any on East Street. That's why I think you see why you see it. Leave in town 47 miles. I think it's, I think it's the, the 47 is just because everybody speeds up so you get around the corner from the real Lord's Prayer Rock because you can see the sign. Once you see the sign, that's possible. I think once you, I mean, I've done it. Once you leave the basin, mm -hmm. past the basin, headed east, you begin yeah. to separate. Well, this is good data for the police, then. They can, I'll give him a copy so he knows where they were, so he can do some uh, enforcement. enforcement. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've had, but I how many accidents down on that area? Kevin could tell us. We had a tractor trailer yeah. coming into town that went off that side of the road because of the Lord's Prayer. number of crashes near Lord's Prayer number of them and is that related to 
But yeah, we'll spend all this money to do signs and everything because we have high accident areas and we, they won't let us reduce our speed limit. I know. I mean, just. And so we, at least the good thing is Josh and, is looking. But on the other hand, they tell us, you guys own the road. We don't own it. It's your road. You, that is, this is why. But when we want to do something, you can't do anything because we told you can't. Yeah. Damn. I don't. I that, that tells me more and more I want to do it. Personally, I think we've got a little Just a, a uphill battle to get this through. To 25? I mean, we I could, we could, we could drive it all 25, but we wouldn't be able to take it. Drive it down there. Leave Route right 7 through. in Pittsburgh and go over to Route 3 to Proctor. You're way out by the old John Deere dealer, and it goes right from 50 to 25. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Right all the way through Proctor until you get to Rutland to Town Line. Well, I don't disagree with it at all, yeah, but I'm just saying the reaction we got tonight. We had the Red Cedar, they made it very clear that. So do you want do you want to just me not deal with this for a little while or do you want me to try to get them again and change the areas make it smaller what's your I don't think moving it you know unless you get it unless you get it up this side of of Mountain Street twenty five even that's it and then we still but we still got to move every other we didn't have it in any direction so we'd have to move every traffic yeah you get there you get about Mountain I'd like to see the Bristol Market and maybe by the church you might get away with it I'd like to see the counter somewhere by Thad's. Just or, right around the creamy street. If I were to make a suggestion, I would say the vicinity of Maple Street. Maybe the creamy street is in the middle of East Street. It's somewhere down by um, Doolittle's old place. Pat, just past George Smith's. And then, you know, so then you're manipulating your data. So then what? You're not going to change the speed limit till they get past Liberty Street? Then you're going to go from Liberty from 30 down to 25. And then remember, because then you oh, have we'll to park side the streets. Oh, there's a whole room with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess, and why I asked, back to the second counters from mm -hmm. North Street, the traffic on Plank Road yeah. and Lower Notch Road, mm -hmm. what, I, I'm glad I got this data here now. Was You know, I've always, since I've been on the board, tried to do a quarter of a mile of that Lower Notch Road. And I kept paving. saying it, paving, mm -hmm. and it justifies it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it doesn't justify it just because Plank Road was paved and it's been within the, the amount limits. of traffic on that road, bigger. It's some Why did they pay? When did they pay? Did they Plank? Pay? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think you can base it solely. I don't say that. we can base it, but I think there's at least the discussion is the there's Lord as Oxford. much traffic and the road is paved. I got that, but, right. yeah. but the right. reason the road is paved. Is different than, than the mantra. There are people up there that want it paved, there are people up there that don't, don't want it paved. Mm -hmm. I think well, that. I, I haven't talked to too many that don't want it paved, with the exception of a few. <laughs> well, a few is a few. Peter um, is looking, I believe he wants to try to tackle the piece that you mentioned last year, which is coming from the, um, from the notch bridge. road. Yep. High bridge coming in. So I know he's trying to tackle that. It also becomes, as we've mentioned before, and Peter has said before, it's not as easy as just throwing down pavement because that road is very narrow and as of course as you know. Um, but that's certainly a conversation you can have with the road foreman. Yeah. Uh, oh, I agree. <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, so, but that is the data you wanted and you were right. It was pretty, very similar numbers. All right, is anybody admit that they want? I don't think- I, I don't either. think. Oh, redoing it is going to get us anywhere besides fictitious the only, the only way The only way we could do it and manipulate them is to have the cruiser sit right there the whole time the thing is up. So well, frankly, I think using, using well, it's well, it's, it's, rock in, in the area of Ed Shepherd's house was, was a bad selection because you get people, you know, we'll, we'll use uh, Wester as an example, people get on the gas to get up that hill and kind of coast through and they get their back lines. And they're still moving until maybe to get to the next speed limit sign. And East Street historically has been a racetrack as far as the hill down to Lord's Parrot. Even and if all, we every resident of any house that's down there it has complained change. of us about it. Even if we they still go the so, same way. So Chief Alaska, so how many hours or hours a week or a month do we do enforcement speed on East Street or West? Say, Better than 60% of my stationary radar in the villages on East Street near Lord's Okay. 
Thank you. That's why his stats are good down there. Because he's got all his tickets. I know where to go fishing. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Moving on, number four. Discussion, 2016-2017 uh, budget discussion. Okay, so I just want to say, I, you know, obviously, it's moving Saturday and today, I, I think I've got it. But I did ask, I'd like to start with the police budget, because that is why Kevin is here. We had a lot of questions about part-time labor, um, and up, uh, so I, I wanted Kevin to be able to answer those questions. He did provide a memo that I just handed out, if you want to take a few minutes to read it, or he can give you the short version. Memo or even that three-page letter? That, yeah, and the other thing was you'd also mm -hmm. asked for, and this is what Kevin provided to you, law incident analysis time report, um, you wanted to know traffic citations, um, Warning. So you, you wanted to know where the majority of the calls were because you had concerns about the hours, how many hours the part-timers were going to be on. You also had a concern about having part-time officers work the weekends because you felt they were less, had less experience. So I think okay. those would be good things for Kevin to address. Right. Yes. Um, well, I guess go ahead, Chief. Say your piece. <laughs> there you go. Um, I don't know what I say. The one I wrote. Maybe. We have a chance. Yeah, it's just hard because they just memo. got it. Was handed to us, yeah. Okay. Well, we just I, yes, I, I really we just got it today <laughs> with being Saturday. So let's just talk about it anyway. So what what Kevin what we had budgeted for Kevin and I had prepared was the 32 hours of part time labor, and. Um, as Kevin had talked about, or I had explained on Saturday, was some of it was going to have someone come in and work a shift. You know, Brian used to work the 6 a.m. to 2, which allowed uh, for Kevin to have coverage. Because if you look at his numbers, you can see that we figured that, what was the number you were carrying? A f uh, third to a... Well, if you look at the incident, which the law incident report, um, the about 36% of all incidents come in during the day, during the times that I'm working. <laughs> um, if you look at the arrest data, 34% uh, of all the arrests were made during my shift. Not necessarily by me, but during my shift. Um, and traffic citations, 30% of all traffic citations were issued by, during my shift, and 21% of all traffic warnings were issued during my shift and on those um, uh, reports that I gave you, I, I basically read inked a block around the, around the area where I'm working. So that was helpful. Um, the other thing, Kevin, you could address was your concern about ending at a too early at night. That yeah, was like, I'll, 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 I'm going to take a shot at the way I explained it to you. Yeah, that's good. Um, <clears throat> When it comes to scheduling officers to work, I mean, in any perfect world, it would be nice to have 24-hour protection, an officer on duty 24 hours. We can't afford that. Um, what I become then is the little boy in the dike, and I have to start putting plugs in the holes that are leaking on the dike. And what I'm trying to do is keep as much of the water from leaking past the dike as possible. And in doing that, I try to schedule our officers when they have the most effectiveness and when they're going to encounter the most kinds of complaints. If we start moving that, um, we've actually seen what happens when we move that. Um, if you look at these statistics, if we were to, say, have the day shift officer come on early and then go home and be on call until the evening officer came in, the likelihood that we're going to expend funds for call-outs goes way up because of the number of calls in the middle of the day. Um, late at night, you have sort of the same problem, but what is more of an issue, I think we've had this conversation before about late night, you know, maybe go home at 11 o'clock, um, there isn't much going on out there. The, the, the comment I made last time we met was there are, there are fewer people out there to witness and report crimes. So what we see when we have either because of short staffing, I recall back when Ed was working for us and was out on workman's comp, and then I was out with, uh, you know, dealing with my late wife's issues. Um, we started to see an increase in burglaries because, you know, why not go hit a house or two at 
10 or 11 o'clock at night and then you get home in time to you know watch the late news we saw an increase in crimes late at night when we pulled our, our officers off the street too early so what i've always done is looked at what's the latest we really need to be on and work backwards um, since we are able to close at least what has always been the most problematic bar in town at midnight and the stores close at midnight um, about an hour after all that winds down is a safe time to go out. We're not seeing a lot of call outs just after the guys go home at 1 o'clock. Probably of the calls we do get, the, the, the majority of them are in that hour or two after they've signed off. So we're kind of pushing the envelope by doing that. If I tweak the schedule any way other than what I'm currently doing, we're going to see an increased number of call outs. I'm trying to be as effective with our staffing as possible, and that's why we schedule the way we currently do. The advantage to <clears throat> the recommendations I've made in increasing our part-time staff, it's, it's sort of a half step towards getting us back to a, a four-man department. It's going to enable us to increase our active patrol time by about 18%. Um, we'll be able to be actively patrolling during the times the kids are trying to get to school. Um, it gives us a, a bigger overlap during the week so that I can uh, address administrative duties and it will enable us to do what we're able to do with four officers and four and that's provide more uh, service related services to the community. Um, we're, uh, you know, the, the, the educational pieces, the, the warm and fuzzy stuff that, you know, as opposed to just going out and doing patrol. Um, that's essentially what this budget was meant to be able to enable us to do. As far as when I put the part-timers on, they typically are working by themselves. So whether you put them on a day shift on a Monday or a day shift on a Saturday or an evening shift on a Tuesday or an evening shift on a Saturday, I think if you look at some of these statistics, Sunday tends to be relatively quiet. Um, so that day sort of is a no-brainer. But what we are seeing over the last several years are some of our more time-consuming and, and uh, investigative cases are coming in during the week. Um, Monday through Friday, you know, the, the person's calling at 8 o'clock to report an embezzlement case or a major fraud case or a sex crimes case or, you know, they're not calling. Granted, you're good, you can get anything. It's, it's, it's like the box of chocolates. You can get anything you want any time of the day or night, but typically the, the, the kinds of things that we're needing to put our off, more experienced officers on are during the week. Um, the other reason we, we looked at this uh, pro proposal is part-timers historically have been available or more available on weekends than weekdays because they yeah, work they full-time jobs. jobs. Right. So when we, when we uh, lost that fourth position and we're able to get some more hours to have that overlap so I can get administrative duties. The idea was to schedule part-timers for 12 hours sometime during the week. Well, you couldn't get them to come in during the week. Yeah. So we ended up doing the overlap with our full-time people and having those uh, part-timers cover on weekends. So that's kind of why we're looking at that. And frankly, it's, it's, it's a sort of a cost-free perk with this staffing change, if, you know, if we we're able to do this, that the officers might get a little more time with their, the full-time officers might get a little more time with their families on the weekends because the shifts are being covered by part-time by part-time labor. Okay. Your your new budget proposed was trying to go back to a shift that you used to have when you had four officers starting at six. Right. Um, so are these numbers here that I'm looking at? Because I see like Wednesdays and Fridays. Which from the report are you looking at? The law incidents? The okay. law incidents. Right. From 6 to 8, you know, or at least from 6 to 7, you had one call on Wednesdays or none on Friday. Yeah, which, what, what those represent. In so was that with an officer on or no officer on? No, what some, of, these, well, some time, of them might involve a call out. These are when the calls are received by dispatch. Okay. Now, what typically happens with those, they either have to call us to make a determination whether or not we come out and handle it, or it sits and waits until we sign on. There's a number of times where I come on at nine o'clock and I have calls waiting for me. Okay. And they may have come in two minutes the before I sign on. The dispatcher is talking to the person who's signing that and saying, do you need an officer there now? 
or can that also, um, well, can, is this a, just something you got to report? Or? Sometimes it's a judgment call on the part of the dispatcher, and in other cases they're calling the on-call officer to find out if they think someone should come out. Okay. Um, it's, you know, it really depends on the dispatcher and how they function with other agencies. I know the other day we had a call from dispatch letting us know that there had been a minor crash in the Shaw's parking lot and they had told the people to exchange information because we don't respond to those kind of calls. I corrected the dispatcher and told the dispatcher we respond to all calls for service. That should have been, you know, a case should have been started and we should have been notified of it. Um, we don't, we don't not take calls because we're too busy or anything like that. Um, sometimes they may wait if it's a, a fender bender at seven o'clock in the morning. I'm not going to ask an officer to come out at seven o'clock in the morning on call out pay to handle a, a crash when he can gather that information when he signs on at nine o'clock. But if the, an alarm's going off mm -hmm. at, a, at the bank or at the Rite Aid at seven o'clock in the morning, the officer's going to come out and check. <clears throat> You know, we don't come out in the middle of the night for barking dogs, but a case may be started and it may be sitting on the screen when I sign up. Until the neighbor shoots it, then you come out. Well, I, 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 I should say I have actually gotten calls at home about a barking dog or noise complaint, and I've asked the dispatcher, if you get another call, let me know and I'll go out. If not, I'll look into it in the morning. So there, there's some calls that are handled that way as well. Well, I told them, I mean, each time they've mentioned this, that 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, those kids are going down my street with the skateboards and stopping and checking out the vehicles as they're going down the street. And Is it, you know, I know it's it, it, I mean, to the untrained eye, when you, you know, come into town at 1130, you, you know, you think, well, at least the, the sidewalks are still there, but they'd <laughs> probably be rolled up. Yeah. But if you anyway, take a walk around, or just get out of your car, you'll actually start hearing dogs barking in different areas of the village. If and your fence was fine. There's usually a reason for that. Yeah, if your fence was fine when you went to bed and it's got three flats broke out of it in the morning, and I, the fence, you know, I look out the back when I go home to bed at 11, you know, 11 30. Some so. of these calls that I'm getting during the day are, the day. are three in the morning. Right, or 11 o'clock at night. In fact, we're finding a lot of our car breaks and just like, yeah, we're investigating them. Are happening, you know, like between. Um, yeah, but they're happening between 11 and 1 or 11 and 2 or something like that. Some of them are happening right after they go off, but you have some things that are happening um, late in the evening when the officer's on and they're patrolling, but they're they not seeing. I mean, yeah. we drive, if I drive down your street, depending on which direction I come from, and you're standing out in your driveway and you hear a vehicle coming. And you're up to no good. <laughs> Are you going to stand there <laughs> until we do it? <laughs> so, you know, we deal with that at night as well. But. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and once you drive by, they know you're not going to turn around and come right back if, they did, if you didn't see them. Right. Oh. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, yeah. that's going to happen. But, you know, as, as, I, as I've always explained, we need to have somebody on at least until the businesses are closed and the bars are shut down. And then, you know, Typically, for some period of time after that, um, we were keeping officers on duty until two in, two in the morning. Um, well, actually, when we had four officers for a while, we if you remember this, but we were scheduling officers till three in the morning. And the problem we were running into is we were getting asked to take calls that were state police calls. Um, and at that time, we only had one officer on in Middlebury, so it was a bit of an officer safety concern to have officers on that late. So we back that off to two in the morning. Um, so now we're going to two or one, two yeah, on weekends, Friday and Saturdays? This budget is approved as, as I wrote it, or as we tweak it a bunch. You know, with, with, the, with the staffing I've requested from in part-time labor, we will probably have an officer on uh, at uh, as early as six in the morning until two o'clock the next morning on, 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 on weekdays. Now, and I was a little, a little confused and I've been asking the question on the, the cameras that we, the body cameras and the oh, yeah. car cameras. Can you explain this? Yes. And I actually oh, talked to Josh, oh, did I you? Josh on Saturday night and said, oh. Josh, why are we placing body cameras if they were only 18 months old and after we bought? And he said um, that this taser is not, they're not tasers, but the taser company that you're working with 
The taser cameras. Taser cameras. Oh, I thought he missed that meme, didn't he? Yeah, we, we had a... Every body camera you turn in and give you one mm -hmm. that will match the, with the car so it all goes up to the cloud, so to speak. Oh, nice. Essentially, yeah. Essentially. So I was confused. I thought we were just, okay, we're buying cameras again and we just bought 18 months ago. But the no. body cameras are one for one swap. Am I correct in saying that? It, I, the way I explained it to them so they would understand it, it's kind of like a cell phone uh, plan. You know, where you pay for uh, a plan and you get, you know, you get a free upgrade every year or two, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's essentially the same thing. Initially, we would be buying five cameras. Two of those cameras would replace one uh, watch guard system in the car. Um, what they would, what you would have essentially is one of these on the windshield covering your traffic stops like the camera currently does and you'd have the other one covering the the person in the back when you're transporting them. Um, those would have uh, you know it's all wireless and data you know okay. free so we would have a lot of less time spent you know changing